So, Chuck, I want to welcome you and our listeners back. We have enjoyed taking some time in Chapter 1, in Volume 1 of Bob Inc.'s Reform Dogmatics. And I think one of the most stirring passages in Bob Inc. is in this first chapter. And I think the first time I read it, I was really struck by how breathtaking it was to sit and chew on those beautiful words. And I was talking with you privately off of our recording, and you indicated something similar to me. So before we got into the meat of chapter two here tonight, which I think flows, there's a continuity from chapter one to two. I just wondered if I could ask you to maybe close out our chapter one visit with that quote, and then we can maybe segue into the new chapter there. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, I was really stricken with how well he sums up this first chapter on, on dogmatics. And he does it by uh, making sure that we understand that there, there is a distinction between dogmatics and ethics, right? He says dogmatics describes the deeds of God done for, to, and in human beings. Ethics describes what renewed human beings now do on the basis of and in the strength of those divine deeds. In dogmatics, human beings are passive. They receive, they believe. In ethics, they are themselves active agents. In dogmatics, the articles of the faith are did. In ethics, the precepts of the Decalogue. In the former, that which concerns faith is dealt with. In the latter, that which concerns love, obedience, and good works. And then I thought this last part here just really sums it up. Dogmatics set forth what God is and does for human beings and causes them to know God as their creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Ethics sets forth what human beings are and do for God now. How, with everything they are and have, with intellect and will, and with all their strength, they devote themselves to God out of gratitude and love. Dogmatics is the system of the knowledge of God. Ethics is that of the service of God. So, yeah, dogmatics is the system of the knowledge of God. And that's really what we're spending time doing here. And that's why we're taking the time to, to work through this four-volume set on Reformed Dogmatics. It's, it is the system of the knowledge of God. And What greater thing could we be doing than spending time learning about God and doing more as far as understanding God? I thought that was a great way to sum up that first chapter now that we are going to move into the next chapter about the method and organization of how we do dogmatics, the dogmatic theology. Oh, my friend, thank you for that. Uh, What a stirring passage. And I want to reread part of it again. I'm sorry, but it was so stirring to my heart in the sense that it gives this roadmap. We have some some toddlers in our church, and they have their first little textbooks, their first little, little writing books. And of course, they're written and for young people who do not yet know how to read and write. So they have very large words, and they have very simple concepts. And for me, this passage is a map that outlines how Bovink is going to treat and relate dogmatics. And also, by the way, Chuck, I think this is the master key between understanding Herman Bovink's four volumes of his Reformed Dogmatics and then understanding his more recent work that's come out in English on Reformed Ethics. In a sense, based on this passage here, there's different sides of the same coin. And so let me find that quote. In dogmatics, human beings are passive. They receive and believe. In ethics, they are themselves active agents. And uh, I love that distinction. I love that idea that there is, what does it mean to, to do a work? In some sense, one can do a work by not doing a work. That is to say, one can receive a thing. And so this sentence about dogmatics and people being passive dogmatics in the sense that dogmatics is about storing up treasures, a deposit of faith we hear from the scriptures. And then that storehouse gets transmitted from one generation to the next. And what a beautiful thing that is. But it's important for the next generation that receives the transmission to, in some sense, passively receive it. So, Could you imagine, Chuck, if our children, when we sent them to school, were already critics in the modern, secular, Geisteswissenschaften sense? And what I mean by that is imagine our young first graders, second graders, and third graders going to school 
with the idea that as they're being taught the alphabet, as they're being taught their primary language, they should sit in judgment on their teachers, and they should ask those teachers to, to justify why it is that the teachers are teaching the way they're teaching. I think most of us would agree that they're, that's silly, that's overstated, that's an abuse of the best, of the critical approach to life. And yet, I think that's exactly what many people do when it comes to dogmatics. Dogmatics is something to be received first. There will be a time for action in our lives, and that's the goal, uh, the goal and scope of the portion that Bavinks refers to as ethics. But one does not at first approach a new system of knowledge, such as theology, or any system in fact, without first undergoing this stage of receiving as from a canon. And that, in the best sense, is what Christian dogmatics is, is this organized canon that we wish to impart to our young people in the faith. And when I say young people, adults as well, anybody who's new to the doctrines of the scriptures and new to saving faith in Christ, we want them to have these good things, and we prepare that. So having said that, I think that puts us, like you said, in perfect place to talk about an introduction for chapter two and how how it is that this material, this met this dogmatic material is organized and the methods by which we as pedagogues try to teach and to bring new people into a knowledge. And it's not perhaps so much about indoctrination or brainwashing or keeping people from thinking critically. If I've certainly heard that accusation that Christianity is about shutting people's brains off. I don't think it's about that, but I think it's about a recognition that you have to start somewhere. And mature believers in the faith would have us to start from a firm place, from a firm foundation, and move into something beautiful that God, through his Holy Spirit, will unfold in our lives. So that brings us into chapter two, Chuck. And let me just throw that over to you to check in with the segue and what you think about this second chapter, and when we start talking about the materials that it shares with us. Yes, you know, what I really appreciate that Bavink starts right out here in, in chapter two, very clearly talking about what it takes to do dogmatics. And he points out that there's really three factors that come into play in the way that we do dogmatics and how we acquire material for our dogmatics, and he talks about three things, Holy Scripture, uh, the Church's confessions, and Christian consciousness. And what I appreciate about that is that he's, he understands that there is somewhat of a balance, right? That there are these, it is about Scripture, but it's also about Church's confession and Christian consciousness, and these are all things that, that we must consider. As you had noted before, this isn't an area where we just put our minds in neutral and not use our brains and forget any sort of intelligence we have. That's not what's being asked to be done when we do dogmatics. We do consider uh, our intellect, but we do that in balance with and without any sort of uh, fighting against these other factors, including Scripture and the Church's confession. And so in, in doing that, we recognize that as we're doing this work of dogmatics and playing on what we talked about at the end of chapter one, we've got to some extent, we as humans, yes, we are, we are passive in terms of how we receive dogmatics. It, it is something that we receive as we do with scripture. It's not something that we just make up ourselves. It's not something that, that we try to discover in, in, in our inner selves, but it is something that's provided to us. But it is also still something that we can think about and that we can engage with, both individually in our own Christian consciousness and collectively through the church. And one of the things I really appreciate about Bavinck's having those three factors that all play with each other and balance with each other is that in doing that, he moves away from some potential problems that we have when we make one or the other too strong or focus on one at the, at the detriment of the other two. And for example, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this more in throughout chapter two, but 
In chapter one, we spend some time talking about 19th century philosophy and the 19th century Tian way of thinking that sort of presented itself, modernism. And in that modern way of thinking, there was a real tendency to focus solely on the self, to focus solely on whether it would be the rational intellect in some cases, or we may move into irrationalism and just, but still it's the self, it's the how do we engage ourselves with our inner life? And we forget about the importance of scripture and the importance of the church's perfection. And when we lose that balance, we lose a lot. And error can certainly abound in doing that. But then even beyond that, you and I have been doing some discussions on some of, the, some of our other talks about some of the 20th century reaction to that 19th century liberalism, a 20th century reaction that in some ways we look at and say, hey, we're glad for this, uh, this neo-orthodoxy. And yet a lot of those neo-orthodox uh, theologians, Karl Barth and others who followed in his footsteps, still didn't quite get that balance. They understood that perhaps there needed to be something more than the inner light, the inner self that we needed to, to think about. But in some cases, the focus became just real heavy on what is the church's confession and how does the church deal with things and with, without really still a focus on scripture. And if that's maybe a move away from mere individualism, mere inner thinking about one's own inner self as the most important thing, it still misses the importance of scripture and gets thrown out of whack. Similarly, I think there, there has also been in the 20th century and really even starting in the 19th century with the Pietist movement in the 20th century with the fundamentalist movement, a, a move in, in another direction where we, the focus is so much on scripture, but the, and which in and of itself is a good thing, but without the balance of also considering the church's confession, without the balance of considering Christian consciousness. And in that case, what some people have called biblicism, which is an overly, almost an idealization of Scripture alone can occur. And certainly we do believe in sola scriptura. That's not what I'm saying. But we start getting into situations like we get where people say, hey, no creeds, no confessions. It's only, only Scripture, which interestingly is a creed in and of itself. But, and that can lead us into other types of errors as well, because we forget about that balance that we also have with the fact that the church has been given to us by God, instituted by Christ to play a role, and the Holy Spirit as well plays a role in that Christian consciousness and, and gives us some ability still to do some of that thinking through and reflecting on our own, but always doing it in the light of Scripture and in the light of the church's confession. One of the things that I like about the way that Bobbing has done this is that there is almost this Trinitarian structure, right? The, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in, in, in the Trinity. Here, Bobbing has, uh, the, the, they don't exactly line up with the work of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We do have, we have Scripture, which tells us of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. We've got the Church's confession, and the Church was created by Christ. And then we have the Christian consciousness, which... Every day, our Christian consciences should be affected by the Holy Spirit. And so this Trinitarian method of thinking through how we do dogmatics just really impressed me. And, and I can see just so many places where thinking through that three-way method or that three-way system, doing dogmatics, can really strengthen that and make sure that the work that we do in dogmatics and in the work we do in understanding what are God's commands and what is God's will and understanding who he is and what scripture says, using that sort of that three-leg stool or that Trinitarian focus can be really helpful to us. Oh, thank you for that, my friend. Thank you so much. And, and I, want to, I want to respond to what you've said and follow up there. I think this is one of the most important statements in this section, what you've just highlighted on. And I'm going to read it again, and we're going to talk about it to clarify. And there's a reason why. You've already dealt with some of the reasons why it's important to clarify here. But I just want to double emphasize or put a stake in it again so that it's not easy to misunderstand what Bob Inc. is saying here. And here's that sentence. Three factors come into play in understanding the manner 
in which dogmatic material is acquired and treated. Holy Scripture, the Church's Confession, and Christian Consciousness. Depending on whether or not any of these one factors are used, overestimated or underdeveloped, and how it is positioned in a modified relation to the remaining two, the starting point of dogmatics, as well as its development and content, will differ. Now, the first thing that I want to say here is that's just because Bob Inc. is stating that there are three factors that come into play in understanding where we get dogmatic material from, that doesn't mean that all three factors are the same or that all three factors are equally authoritative or have equal weight. So Holy Scripture, the Church's Confession, and Christian Consciousness, these are three dimensions that absolutely matter in understanding what doctrine or dogma is. And in saying this, Bavink is not putting all three of them on equal footing. We're going to see throughout the Reformed dogmatics that Bavink is going to uphold and strengthen the position of sola scriptura, maturely understood, let me put that out there. So the Holy Scripture is going to have a special place, a unique place, a supreme court of authority place in terms of a source for dogmatic material. Uh, we're also going to talk about the church's confession. And Chuck, you and I think about the classic creeds and confessions of the Protestant Reformation and how important they are and have been. And yet, every single one of those creedal authors would tell you that the creeds are subordinate standards. So they're helpful. They're cliff notes. They're, they're helpful explanations for young people to study and learn. They're also useful for theologians who want to reinforce mature language that, and the development of reasoning in Christian lexicons, in Christian dictionaries. And yet, the confessions do not stand on the same pillar as the Scriptures, but they support it in another way, even as a subordinate standard. And then finally, Christian consciousness. There's a place for the inner light of one's self in dogmatics. And at first, that sounds like we're opening the door to relativism or to some form of inner subjectivism that trumps the Holy Scriptures. But Bobbink is going to carefully talk about this and develop about this in, in sections to come. And so you mentioned an important thing, and that was the multidimensional nature of these three factors. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, says this, Though one person may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Let me read that again. One person may be overpowered. Two people can defend themselves. A cord of three strand is not quickly broken. And I think that's what we want to do in thinking about these three factors, the Holy Scriptures, the Church's confession, and the Christian consciousness. These three factors work together in a divine harmony to reinforce and bless each other they're not enemies. And so when I find, for example, people outside of Reformed theology will sometimes criticize an idea of sola scriptura that we confessionalists have, and they'll say, how can you believe in sola scriptura, but then have these creeds and confessions? Or they might say, how can you believe in sola scriptura and talk about the inner light, looking inside of one's self? to understand the practical truths of the faith. And first of all, these are legitimate questions, and we need to answer them. But the first point is to note that we, on the Reformed side, do no service to ourselves or to Christianity, to orthodoxy, by only saying we have one. Christian orthodoxy is not a single strand, but rather it is this complementary three-chord system. And as the Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes verse points out that gives a Christian life and thought a robustness to it. And I just wanted to say that. So, so Bobbink is not abandoning sola scriptura to point out these three factors because they're not 
three identical factors, but they're three complementary factors, and the two other factors are subordinate in relation to the one. Let me read from, from my Confession of Faith. This is the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, and this is chapter 1, section 10. And it says this, the supreme judge for deciding all religious controversies and for evaluating all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, human teachings, and individual interpretations, and in whose judgment we are to rest, is nothing but the Holy Scripture delivered by the Spirit. In this Scripture, our faith finds its final word. And there it is. We have a creedal statement pointing to the Scriptures alone as the final authority, or as it is mentioned in this version, the supreme judge for deciding all religious controversies. Now, is that contradicting sola scriptura for you and I to cite this passage of the confession? No, it's supporting. The confession here is the servant of the scriptures. It is a help to the student. It is a help to the young person so that they understand the importance of it. And it's going to be the same when it comes to Bobbing talking about the role that a mature Christian consciousness will play in dogmatics. And there's another thing here. He says, depending on whether or not any one of these factors is used, overestimated or underestimated or underdeveloped, how it is positioned in a modified relation to the remaining two, the starting point of dogmatics as well as its development and content will differ. Chuck, that's a million dollar statement. Bavink is saying here in a mature fashion that Christian orthodoxy as it's developed throughout the centuries could take these different forms in development. And he's going to talk about what that means. Now, what he's not saying here is he's not saying Christianity is a free-for-all. Let's spin the wheel of fortune and see what kind of Christianity we come up with today. But what he is saying is that if you look through the various times in history of God's redemptive plan, we see this progressive development. We see the interplay of these three factors. Now, for, I'll just take one example. In this chapter 2, Bavink is going to talk about the beginning of the church period. So these are the very first years, the first century or two, on into the early development of a brief confessional statement, the Apostles' Creed in its various forms, as well as this idea of the Christian consciousness. Now, what's the factor that plays not the least role in here, but what's the factor that does not play the role it plays today? And that is Holy Scripture, because in the earliest parts of the New Testament church, the canon was not present. It was being, it was being written in the generation of the Apostles, and then it was being recognized in the generation that came after that. So the early years was about bootstrapping and bringing up this authority. Now, this doesn't mean that Christianity at that time was anti-scriptural. No, but what it does mean is there's a richness in organic development that must be maintained and understood for a balanced student of theology to be able to weigh these various factors. And wow, that's a million dollar sentence in my book. And when I read that, I was just like, I have to talk to Chuck about this. We have to go over this sentence because I think it is, it's the key to understanding. Because if you look at other forms of Christianity and you trace their history, you'll find that it's that very thing coming out here. Depending or on whether or not any one of these factors is used, whether any one of these factors is overused or underused, the starting point of dogmatics in a region, in a school of thought, as well as its development and content, will differ. So baked into Christianity from the beginning is the wideness of this generous nature of orthodoxy. And wow, that's, did I mention that's a million-dollar paragraph and a million-dollar sentence? I want to throw it over to you, Chuck, just to follow up with that. We're just in the first sentence of Pericope 13, and already I feel we've, we have gone this long journey on this really important segment. But how does it strike you? Yeah, one of, one of the interesting things where I've experienced 
just this kind of discussion and how important I think it is to understand this and how key Bob Vink's laying this out for us is in some discussions I've had with, with Roman Catholic brothers and sisters on what it is that we as Reformed uh, believers believe. And they will often use, they'll throw the term sola scriptura at me and say, you Protestants, you're, you're crazy. All you want to do is talk about scripture, but you can't possibly do that because you have to also consider this and that and the other thing. And, and some, a term that I've heard used, and I don't know that it's good Latin, but other people have used it, as I'll point out in just a moment. But what I've told them is like, no, what we believe is sola scriptura, not solo scriptura. It's by scripture alone, not just scripture only and nothing else. And, and, and after having that discussion one time, I went and just did a little bit of uh, further looking at it. And I thought there is, oh, probably from about a, a dozen years ago, Michael Horton, who is a Reformed uh, pastor and thinker, uh, teaches at Westminster a seminary out on the West Coast, he had some discussion about that idea as well, contrasting uh, the reformational view of the sufficiency of Scripture with that of the, the Roman Catholic view. And what he said is this, the Latin slogan sola scriptura means by Scripture alone, not Scripture alone, solo scriptura. So, for example, both Lutheran and Reformed churches regard the ecumenical creeds along with their own confessions and catechisms as authoritative and binding summaries of Scripture to which they are all subordinate. We accept these statements because they summarize biblical teaching not on the basis of the church's authority. The key difference is that whereas the Roman Catholic view treats the church's authority as magisterial or sovereign, churches of the Reformation view it as ministerial, subordinate to Christ's scriptural word. And, and that, that ends the quote from Horton. But I think that's really important to see because we still have, as Bob points out, we still have not just Holy Scripture, but we have the church's confession. We have Christian consciousness. We, they play a specific role. They, we don't just take one and throw out the other ones, but they do engage with each other. And, and there's a sense in which I think we, we could say that Bavink might say that the Roman Catholic view of the church's authority as magisterial, as sovereign, overweighs uh, that factor of Christian confession. It overestimates it as opposed to scripture and Christian consciousness in the same way that in some other traditions might uh, underestimate. So that, that conversation that I've had with, with folks, it, it really plays into this conversation. And it just gives, there's so much weight in what Bob is saying there that it's just so useful. And it's like you said, it's the million dollar sentence here. It's uh, uh, the one, that one sentence, and there are many other ones, by the way, in this four volume set, but it's one sentence that makes the cost of uh, purchasing the entire uh, four volume set worth it. <laughs> Amen, my friend. Amen. It's so true. Now, let's, you and I, step into Bavink's time machine here in section 13, Pericope 13. Let's step into Bavink's time machine and go back to, the, to what he calls the earliest period of the Christian church. So this is the immediate aftermath the apostolic generation, so Christ has died and was risen again, and he ascended into heaven. And in the generation that came, this apostolic generation, here apostolic meaning and referring to the set of folks who were eyewitnesses and who were directly commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself to go and be his witnesses in the world and talk about what they had seen. In that generation and then in the generations that followed, Bavink points out there was no difference between the word received in apostolic preaching and the word passed down in writing. So if you and I were in that 50 to 75 year period of the first century 
we would have this same immediacy to hear something spoken and to see it in a very early written form would be so much the same. The whole of it, now here's the beauty, and this is why I say I'm so impressed with God's plan here. Bavink says the whole of it was based on the Old Testament, which was at once and without resistance accepted and recognized by the Christian churches as the Word of God. From the beginning, the Old Testament was, for Christians, the book of Revelation, augmented and completed in these last days by the word of the gospel through the oral and written preaching of apostles. What's that saying? That's saying that in this first century time period, we had something very unusual. We did not yet have a widespread canon of New Testament writings, but that does not mean that we did not have a canon. In fact, we had the Old Testament. And what was the Old Testament? The Old Testament was the written revelation of God, and Christians received it and cherished it from the very beginning. Wow, that's beautiful. And from the very beginning, Bavink points out, both the Old Testament as well as the apostolic preachings and writings held authority in the churches of Christ and were viewed as sources of knowledge. I want to emphasize how unusual that is to us today. So during this first century, this first 50, 75 years after the death of Christ, we have a very unusual situation in which people are speaking and teaching, proclaiming orally the Word of God, and that oral proclamation is resting upon the bedrock of the written proclamation of the Old Testament. That's beautiful. That's so different from today, though. Today we have the New Testament writings, and you and I, Chuck, reading these scriptures, I have my copy of the Holy Bible in front of me, and I tend to think of it as all of a piece. And it is to me in this day, and it is to you in this day. But in this first century, in these 50 to 75 years after Christ, this apostolic generation, there was actually, it, was a, it would have been very different for us to have been in that time. And so from them, people drew their knowledge of God in the world, of angels and human beings, of Christ and Satan, of church and sacrament. And so from these times, it was customary to demonstrate the truth of the faith, the confession of the church, by means of the Holy Scripture and the Scriptures of the prophets and the apostles. Now, here's an important sentence. Dogma was that which Christ and the apostles had taught, not that which had been conceived by philosophy. Christianity, at its inception, at its beginning, was not a philosophical endeavor. It was not a product of the academy. It was not the bouncing of ideas from one idea man to another idea man in a cultured wine and cheese seminar where people got together to talk about the latest in unmoved mover arguments. No, it was a theology of life on the streets in the first century. And the bedrock of that was the written revelation of the Old Testament. Chuck, this astonishes me because I think sometimes people in our day walk around with this copy of the Holy Bible that we have, and from a practical point of view, it seems like most people spend maybe 60, maybe 80 percent, maybe 90 percent of their time in the New Testament reading, and I don't want to begrudge anybody that. People who are doing that are doing a good thing, but I want to tell you, 100 percent of the Bible is the Word of God, and that is to say if someone finds themselves very infrequently in the Old Testament, or let's say certain segments of the Old Testament, then they are really missing out. And the first century church was under no such compunction. Rather, the Old Testament themselves was the book that they carried around, even as these New Testament writings were coming into being. And I just want to tell you how, how real Bavink made that for me when I was reading this. What's your take? What can you draw from thinking about this first century situation? 
I, I really appreciate that. And your comments there are really helpful. It's interesting to me in this is a, it's a fairly new thing in my congregation. I know in, in certain more liturgical traditions, even within the Reformed tradition, uh, it perhaps is not, uh, was not so uncommon, but the Dutch Reformed tradition, which was a little bit more of a low church tradition until recent years, this is a new thing. But when our current pastor came, he introduced uh, just a very simple, uh, a simple thing that he would have us always stand before the reading of the word, We'd stand during the reading of the word, and then at the end of it, he would say, this is the word of the Lord, and we'd all respond, thanks be to God. And I remember looking into that a little bit and, and be, being impressed by it, and then learning more, that there's a little bit more to that tradition. And I learned that also uh, just in, in also dealing with another congregation where I occasionally have the opportunity to preach, and they would do the same thing. Except they, they always insisted, and still do when I preach there, they always want to have an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading. And it may be that the New Testament text will be the primary text for the day, but they wanted to always have that Old Testament and New Testament reading. And often what they would do, and as far as, as the reading would go, I would read the Old Testament, and I would say, this is the word of the Lord, and they would say, thanks be to God. And then I would read typically a gospel section, but it works also with, with the epistle, the epistles. I would say, this is the gospel of Christ, or I would repeat, this is the word of the Lord in the case of the epistles. And then they would respond with, glory to you, O Lord. And the fact that they did it slightly different was interesting to me, but it was also a reflection, I think, and as I dug into this a little bit, it was a reflection of the importance that is still placed on the fact that Old Testament scripture played such an important role in, in the early church. And while, as you pointed out, there, during the, these first hundred years or so after Christ, uh, the church is still gathering together the kin. In fact, for really the first hundred years after Christ's birth, it's, some of it is still being written, right? Uh, up to about 100 AD is when uh, John wrote uh, the book of Revelation. And so it's all being gathered there. But as you point out, they still had the written word in the Old Testament, and that was there. And, and so this tradition of this congregation where I get to preach every so often, which I learned of and experienced a little bit in part because of some of the changes we'd made in our own congregation, really inspired me to the point where now when I, when I preach, I always make sure to have an Old Testament and a New Testament text. I, I think even before this, I was always careful because this was what I was taught in, in the courses that I took to be licensed to preach, always to preach the whole counsel of Scripture, to, to consider both old and new in, in what you read, but to really remember that, hey, this the early church, what they had written down for them was the Old Testament. And so much of, of the tradition of the church, so much of what, what we do today is still based on the work that was done in that early church when they still only had the written Old Testament. The New Testament was still being sort of pulled together and being written and being gathered together into a canon. Now, that's not to in any way denigrate the New Testament. As you pointed out, that's great that people are spending time with the New Testament. Absolutely, we should spend the time with the New Testament as well. But uh, yeah, I think pointing out uh, what was happening in, in the very early church really does strengthen, I think, for us and the importance of the Old Testament, because that was the written word of Scripture. That was the, the that scriptural portion of that, that three point, those three factors of dogmatics that the early church had. And so much of what we do in dogmatics today, we owe to, to that early church and to the work that was done at the time. Now, there's one follow-on aspect here that I want to reference, and it takes us a little bit beyond the text of Bavink, but I hope the tie-in is there. And that is to say, after you and I having talked about the Old Testament being, quote-unquote, the Bible of the early church in the first century after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, I want to then show how it is precisely this neglect of one of these factors that's going to lead into trouble, and how we're going to see people want to see the early church as 
having all of the elements that orthodoxy has today. And in fact, it was in the process of constructing those things. And so, Chuck, just like you don't have the blessing and benefits of a house before it's constructed, so too, so much of orthodoxy that we take for granted today is an organic process that was developed, that was built through these centuries. In that context, I want to bring up one particular heresy and talk about it to just show how right from the beginning, the church was plagued by people who wanted to run with Christian doctrines, but wanted to run with them in these new, in these unusual, and in these crazy directions. And so I was thinking about the heretic Marcion of Sinope, and Marcion lived in the transition from the first, second, first century to the second century. Some people think he was a mariner or a ship master in, in, as in his younger years, and he was a convert to Christianity who became a preacher. And what he preached was he preached that God, the God who had sent Jesus Christ, was an entirely new and an alien God who was distinct from the vengeful God of Israel who had created the world. And so Marcion considered himself a follower of Paul, the apostle Paul, whom he believed to have been the only true apostle of Jesus Christ. And so Marcion, early in this second century, as we transition here, is publishing one of the earliest collection of New Testament books. And he's publishing them with this narrative that Jesus Christ is this new God, and he's different. He's distinct from the meanie God, who was the God of Israel in the Old Testament, who had created the world. And so Marcion's story is one of where we start to see that people will take some of these three elements, these three factors that Bavink has talked about, and will start running with them in quite off-the-wall ways. And perhaps it's easy for me, in the light of 20 centuries of Christian orthodoxy, to see Marcion as being off-the-wall and heretical from the very beginning. But I think, Chuck, in light of what we've talked about now, if you or I were to get in Mr. Bobbing's time machine and go back to this first century, transition from the first to the second century to this world, we would find that there was already, right from the beginning, this established church with an Old Testament canon. And now comes along this figure, Marcion, who says, wait a minute, we've got new oral tradition, oral teachings, and we have this, I just wrote a book, this new book, this canon of teachings. And the only the only the teacher that's legitimate in there is Paul. And we can see that even in this transition from the first to second century, Marcion is strikingly different from the continuity that was provided by the very first Christians early in the church's history. And so Marcion has this idea, this ditheistic system, this notion of two gods, a higher transcendent one and a lower god who's a world creator and a ruler. And so it allowed Marcion to, to reconcile what he thought were contradictions between what the Old Testament talked about and this new gospel message in the New Testament. And so Marcion has this idea that Christianity is in complete discontinuity with Judaism, and that Christianity is opposed entirely to these scriptures. Now, there is one book that Marcion produced that was titled Antitheses, which we don't have in its own form today, but, but of course we have writings of others criticizing Marcion, and so that's how we know about this book. But in this book, Marcion contrasts the demiurge of the Old Testament, that's his term, with the he heavenly father of the New Testament. And so anytime you hear the word demiurge, Chuck, you, your ears should pick up because, um, you know, that really clues us in to the thinking of a certain era and a certain cultural system in the ancient world. And that is to say the Greek cultural system of the Eastern Mediterranean. And so this demiurge is a part of this wider mulligan stew of quote-unquote Greek thought. When I say Greek thought, I think of the empire of Alexander the Great 
and the areas that used to be the empire in the decades and centuries after Alexander's demise, how they had become Greek in culture. And now all of these thoughts were swirling, and it was a mulligan stew. Some early, uh, early philosophical stool- schools, we've talked about that, you and I, Chuck, the pre-Socratics. Some early Greek religious schools think the Greek pantheon. Think also of the influence of the Levantine pantheon, ideas of the different gods of the Canaanites. All of this stuff mixing about in the cauldron that is the Near East, the Greek Near East. And so you have this idea from the beginning of people who are going to be willing to run with orthodoxy in ways that are so novel, so grossly out with what Christianity is, even at that time. And I think Bavink brings that out here by laying these three factors. And so when we understand how these three factors play together, then first of all, we can understand why these kinds of heresies might come up. Somebody is going to take these three factors and emphasize them and weight them differently. Maybe somebody will remove one of the factors or completely reinvent one of the factors and then create something that's new. And so that just really uh, spoke to me a lot. And all of a sudden, the heresies of the early church are coming into light and coming into life. Because I know as a young believer, as a young Christian, I tried to memorize lists of this heresy and that heresy. And I found it so difficult to distinguish between them in time, in place, and in history. But now in the light of this organizing method that Bavink has put together, all of a sudden history is making sense. And so I just wanted to take a a, a divergence there, Chuck, to talk about that. So how does that strike you? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and I appreciate that. that. And bringing Marcion in is, I think, uh, it fits in with what Bavink is talking about. It shows how even in the early church, you start having uh, over or under weighing of various factors uh, and what that eventually leads to. It's interesting to me that we see that error of Marcion, not in specifically uh, exactly the same way, but in undervaluing certain parts of Scripture, we see that repeated over and over again, whether it's the deist of uh, the 18th century or Thomas Jefferson, who crossed out portions of the Bible that just didn't make rational sense to him. Or even today, I'm in some groups of Christians, and they'll be discussing various issues that are uh, happening today in the culture and in the church. And I'll hear people say things like, that was Paul who wrote that, not Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, but it's all scripture. You can't play them off against each other. You have to interpret in the light of all of scripture. And that even, even occasionally, I've ended up criticizing people who come to some of the same conclusions as I do on an issue or two for doing that. I said, look, that's not a valid, that's not a valid argument. And it's interesting to see when we downplay scripture, which, you know, is one of those three factors, what can happen. And we've talked a little bit about what happens with some of the other ones too. So that was a, it may have been a little bit of a side trip, but I think it was a worthwhile side trip. And not too far off the beaten track, but rather up the hill over the side where you get a little better view. So I appreciate the trip. 